2020 has been a real cracker of a year, hasn't it? Natural disasters, political unrest, and of course a global pandemic that is still rocking the world and changing the world forever. Money is tight, so having a great mid-range budget smartphone is more important than ever. So it seems fitting that Apple sees it with the iPhone SE and Google does too with the Pixel 4a. Both are great examples of phones that don't break the bank. OnePlus are also veterans in this space too, having pioneered flagship killers since 2014, undercutting their flagship rivals on price. And now, in 2020, the OnePlus Nord is their answer to the ever-important mid-range smartphone race. This is the OnePlus Nord in blue marble, and I've been using it for the last couple of weeks as my main phone. So, could this be the phone for you? Let's take a look. Okay, so OnePlus has been about two things. Flagship killing whilst doing so with speed and fluidity, and not compromising on price. Now sure, the latter has slowly changed as the product line has matured with the truly flagship OnePlus 8 Pro, so it's a great sign to see that OnePlus is going back to basics with the Nord. At its core, the OnePlus Nord tries to distill the whole modern OnePlus experience into a device that is more accessible without losing that OnePlus spirit. For me, that's the combination of powerful internals, reliable software updates, all on top of a smooth and buttery UI experience powered by Oxygen OS. And on balance, I think OnePlus has really nailed it. Now, if we're talking pure specs, it might not seem so impressive since the phone rocks a slightly slower LPDDR4 RAM, ranging from six to 12 gigs depending on where you live, and a decidedly mid-range Snapdragon 765G, which might not be as mid-range as you might expect though, especially since it looks like the Pixel 5 is gonna use that one as well. And as we know with tech, numbers don't always tell the full story. And certainly as I've been using the Nord from day to day, there's not been a moment at all with general tasks like scrolling social media, browsing the web, or watching YouTube that I felt it's being held back by its hardware. As we know, this is largely thanks to OnePlus's implementation of Android with Oxygen OS, and it's just another great example here running beautifully on mid-range hardware. On top of that, OnePlus are usually pretty quick at adopting and supporting new updates for Android and supporting for longer periods of time too. On top of all of that, they're also often one of the first to adopt new features introduced in Android as well. Take live captioning, for example. And OnePlus were one of the first to actually start using that. The only time where the phone seems to show its limitations is when you start playing really graphically intensive games. So you kind of have to make a few little tweaks to the settings to get a smooth experience. But honestly, for maybe 95% of general tasks, it does it all without a hitch and it's smooth as silk doing so. And the smooth experience is also helped massively by the included 90 hertz screen, which is my favorite inclusion in the phone. And I think you're gonna love it as well. It's something that OnePlus could have easily left this out from a price point perspective. It's a 1080p AMOLED panel, and for its price, it is excellent. The colors are vibrant, the contrast is as you'd expect in an OLED screen with deep, deep blacks. Viewing angles are pretty good. I mean, it does show some slight color casting at the extremes, but honestly, who views their phone at those sort of angles anyway? It also doesn't get quite as bright as the flagships, but it's still quite usable outdoors in the sun. The main weakness that I'm still seeing though are the one that I mentioned in my previous video with the green and pink tint, mainly at low brightness settings. OnePlus has promised a software fix, but like the issues with the S20 Ultra in my other video, I'm pretty skeptical that it's gonna be fixed properly. I mean, I'm someone that does love a good Twitter scroll before bed in the dark, and this tint is pretty distracting and it's pretty noticeable even after using it consistently as my daily device for a couple of weeks. Now, of course, it's not going to match the flagship screens seen on the iPhones and the Note 20 Ultras of the world, but the Nord definitely holds its own. And if you're someone that comes from an older device with an older OLED or LCD, I can absolutely guarantee that you're gonna love it. The other thing you're gonna be super happy with is battery life because it is super solid. The OnePlus Nord has a decent 
4,150 milliamp hour unit, and that's bigger than the previous OnePlus 7 Pro, which had a capacity of around 4,000. And here it's just slightly smaller than the OnePlus 8's 4,300. Combine all of that with the slightly lower powered Snapdragon and a 1080p screen, the Nord easily lasts a full day, and I've been regularly getting six hours of screen on time. Even on more power hungry days, you've still got the warp charger. So there's really no scenario where you're gonna be caught short, and I love that. The only minor caveat to all of this though is the lack of wireless charging, which it's a slight inconvenience, but again, at this price point, it's a compromise I'm willing to make. And speaking of compromises, there are a few other features the Nord emits in the name of price. The first is an official IP waterproof rating. It's a shame, but OnePlus has always been pretty good at making their phones watertight with seals, so I reckon you're gonna be fine if you're caught in a downpour or you get splashed. Do know that if something happens, you're probably not gonna be covered. Another spot of compromise is also in its build. Externally, it looks like classic OnePlus, but it does use a plastic frame rather than aluminium. And as we've seen with Zach from Jerry Rig Everything, does break rather easily, even with Gorilla Glass 5 on the front and the back. That being said, it doesn't feel cheap when holding it though, and the bits that matter, they feel great. The power button, the volume buttons, and the alert slider are all made of a sturdy metal, and yes, they feel tight, clicky, and satisfying to use. It's just funny how something as simple as that can help with the overall feel. Also, speaking of the build, it's only got a single downfiring speaker, not stereo speakers. It's not a bad speaker by any means, but it's still a single downfiring speaker. Now, the next compromise to talk about actually is in its camera, which is always going to be a rather contentious one. OnePlus has opted for a four camera setup for the rear module. And let me tell you, the only lens worth using is the main 48 megapixel shooter taken from the OnePlus 8. And maybe at a pinch, the eight megapixel ultra wide, the depth sensor is, well, a depth sensor, and the macro camera is downright useless. So let's briefly talk about that. Like many modern two megapixel macro cameras seen in other Chinese smartphones, they produce some of the most bland looking shots that really have no redeeming qualities. Honestly, you're gonna be better off just using the main camera and just cropping in slightly. In fact, one of the positives of the main lens is that it's got a pretty good close focusing distance. When you compare it to the macro shots, you end up getting way better detail, way better color, far more natural exposure, and far better natural looking bokeh thanks to its wider f1.75 aperture. I've put some of these samples on my Instagram page, so if you're interested, go ahead and check it out. I often put other sample photos and other tech related content on there, so if you haven't already, I'd love it if you'd follow me over there as well. Anyway, macro disappointment aside, it also doesn't have a telephoto lens, which for me is actually okay. For the majority of users, the standard wide angle is going to be the main squeeze, and in reality, it's gonna be perfectly fine. Colors are generally well represented, and they do a decent job in most lighting situations. It does give off a very distinct color palette though that is common in OnePlus phones of the past with a slightly cooler and contrasty look. And there's also a bit of noise reduction going on here as well. So in general, the shots do look slightly softer compared to other flagship phones, but overall, Still quite pleasing to look at, and in ideal lighting, I mean, it looks as good as any decent smartphone camera out right now. And in poor lighting, well, at least you've got OnePlus's Nightscape feature, which still works really well in the Nord. Then you've also got the ultra wide lens. It's a useful addition, but you can tell cost cutting has happened here because the quality does drop off quite a bit here even in good lighting conditions. It is noticeably softer compared to other flagship ultrawides and you're not gonna use it for prints on the wall. For social media, it's gonna be absolutely fine. Color is decent and the 119 degree field of view does add a little bit of versatility if you need it in a pinch. On top of all of that, the white balance between these two focal lengths, whilst not perfect by any means, has improved in consistency, which is something that I used to have real issues with in older OnePlus phones. Portrait mode on the Nord is actually pretty decent as well. The lack of any telephoto lens means that most portrait photos are taken at wider focal lengths, which thanks to physics and perspectives, it just gives it a slightly more unnatural look. And whether with or without the depth sensor, edge detection is mostly reliable but can be inconsistent at times. It occasionally became confused with hair and it definitely struggled with our furry friends. Despite the sheer numbers of photos I've taken of my dog, it often failed to recognize him as the subject requiring a lot of patience and many takes to get it right. 
It does do fine with a lot of other inanimate objects though, like food. So if you're someone that likes snapping away at their lunch or dinner, posting it on Instagram or to your friends and family, well, you're gonna be satisfied. But what has been nice to see is the addition of an ultra wide selfie on the front camera. It does mean that the hole punch is slightly more elongated as a pill shape, but at least it's using this extra space for something more useful instead of a depth sensor that we saw in the Galaxy S10 Plus. Quality wise, it's as you'd expect from OnePlus. It's decent in good light, but we're not gonna be winning any awards here. Now video recording is also pretty good too. It goes all the way up to 4K 60 frames per second with both the rear and the front modules. And that's something that the iPhone SE and the Pixel 4a can't brag about. Generally speaking, the footage on the main lens is actually pretty good. Colors are accurate with good detail and the combined image stabilization does a really good job at keeping things smooth. You've also got slow motion 1080p at 240 frames per second too. But quality does take a dip when using this, even in good lighting, so just be careful with that. Now the final compromise with the Nord is actually in its availability. A large majority of you watching this video are gonna be from either the US, India, or Australia. And for two of those countries, the Nord is gonna be a great import. It's only gonna be a widely available in India, Europe, and parts of Southeast Asia, at least for the time being. That might change for a North American, but being an Aussie, I'm used to the prospect of having to import OnePlus phones if I wanted one. Now, of course, this has its own challenges as well. Not only just getting your hands on the phone in the first place, but then you have to worry about issues like warranty if something were to go wrong. And then more importantly, proper mobile network support. And what do I mean by that? Well, out of the box, the Nord is able to surf the net with 4G perfectly fine since it supports the right network bands in Australia, but it's crippled by the lack of any official support, meaning that when you have to call someone, the phone isn't able to natively tap into the carrier's voice over LTE bandwidth to make calls. And this is really important because voice over LTE is how a majority of modern carriers provide voice services. It's a much better quality call and it's more reliable as well compared to the old 2G or 3G standard. If you wanna compare it to something, it's kind of like watching a video in high definition as opposed to standard definition. So in Australia, when you make a phone call with the Nord, you can see that it automatically switches to a 3G signal to make the call. And that ends up with a grainier, noisier, and more unreliable experience. But really the worst part of it all is that when 5G keeps growing, 3G technologies are being phased out and taken down, not only in Australia, but around the world. So there is a chance that in the future, you're not gonna be able to make phone calls from the phone. In fact, there are already areas in Australia, mainly in rural areas for now, where 3G towers are already being taken down. And well, if you need to call someone, it's, um, it's gonna be complicated. Now there are actually ways to activate voice over LTE for people like us people who live in pleb countries that aren't officially supported. But these solutions are slightly more on the hackier side of things. I mean, it's not hard, but certainly it's not for the everyday Joe blogs to simply plug it into a computer, hit a button and expect it to work straight away. It's certainly not as elegant as that. And as with OnePlus's reputation for, you know, being pretty good with software updates, the hack tends to reset with every software update as well. So you're just gonna have to keep repeating this process over and over again. But if this is something that you're still interested in, I'll put a link in the description to the forum on XDA developers, and that'll walk you through how to activate this feature. But for everyone else though, the OnePlus Nord represents excellent value in a world where cost is even more important. At 25,000 rupees for the Indian exclusive base model with six gigs of RAM and 64 gigs of storage, it's a super accessible price for a really great phone. Even at 380 pounds or 410 euros with eight gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage, it's still a pretty darn good deal. As an Aussie, you can expect to import the eight gigabyte version with 128 gigs of storage for roughly 650 Aussie bucks, which keep in mind is still cheaper than the iPhone SE Sure, the phone on paper has its compromises, but I reckon OnePlus has done an absolutely amazing job at compromising in precisely the right parts of the phone. Using it, it still felt exactly like using any OnePlus phone, and it never felt like it was being held back. Honestly, as to quote OnePlus, the Nord really could be everything you could ask for. For us Aussies or Americans though, just take an extra second to think and see whether or not its limitations and the risks associated with it is worth the price.
But if you live in a country where it's sold officially and is supported properly, I've got no hesitation in recommending it for yourself or your friends and family. It's a really great phone. Anyway guys, what do you think of the Nord? Is it something that you've been looking for? Let me know in the comments section below. As always, thank you so much for watching the video. Give us a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe for more. Ding the bell icon so you don't miss out. As always, stay safe guys, and I'll catch you in the next one. Say good day to your mom for me. Cheers.